Well, good morning. Today is most certainly a wonderful day to worship the Lord, is it not? Yes. Amen. Every day is a great day to worship the Lord. Would you join me in standing and singing this morning? We are going to sing the Lord's Prayer. And what I love about this song is the way that it focuses us on the words that Jesus spoke and told us how to pray. It allows us to connect with God on a personal level. We are, when we sing this song, we are talking with our Heavenly Father. And isn't that amazing that we know He responds, that He answers, that He cares, and, and that He gives us all the things that we are asking Him for uh, in His own way. So let's sing this together knowing that we are approaching our Father with confidence this morning.
trust in your word, the word that teaches us of how Jesus came and died for our sins, how he rose again on the third day, bringing us with him to new life, how he ascended to your right hand where he sits for all eternity, how he gave us his spirit to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us, how we are, can be encouraged as one body of believers, as one church, unified, in that one gospel. Lord, your word teaches us that we are to celebrate and to praise your name at all times. So this morning, Lord, we thank you for the great work that you are doing in our world and in us. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. And we hope that as you've come today, as we just sang, that we have come with open hearts, that God's word would speak to us this morning, and that he would minister to us through his word. And uh, one of the things that uh, we've just been feeling lately um, is just a sense of excitement. I know as a, a, a pastoral a staff, um, we just sense God doing amazing things in our midst. Um, we, we look back, we've seen, you know, eight baptisms in the last a uh, couple months, and we just rejoice in what God is doing in the lives of people, and that really happens uh, through the ministries of the church, and uh, through each one of us uh, using our gifts and serving um, with the gifts that God has given to us, and one of the things we like to do is to really lift up our ministries uh, to the Lord and ask his blessing upon them, and, and also just that he would protect us as well. We know when um, God is, is doing things, uh, the enemy is not pleased, and so we just want to ask God's protection over these ministries, and uh, in, you know, we have less than a, a month now left until summer, unfortunately, is over, I'm sorry to, to tell you that, but with that comes another ministry season, and we're just excited for what God is going to be doing beginning in September in a lot of these ministries, and we know that some are ongoing, so we're just going to lift up these uh, ministries in prayer. And, uh, and also, as we, and this is also a time where we, we bring our offering. And uh, that offering always comes as this place, as this, this uh, offer of worship to the Lord. And we've seen that through 2 Corinthians. The way that we um, give is a reflection of our hearts. Um, but it's also just this way that these sorts of ministries continue to happen. And, um, and so... Uh, if you do have a, a physical offering, we'll remind you you can give it at the box at the back as you leave today, or you can give through e-transfer, a donation at victorybaptist.ca. And um, so uh, we're just going to lift up, again, these ministries in prayer at this time. So do, would you just bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we know that Every good and perfect gift comes down from you. From the Father of heavenly lights, Lord, you are the one who gives us all that we have. And uh, today, as we bring our offering to you, we know that uh, what we give is really from your hands, that you are the Lord of the harvest, that you are the one who supplies the seed to be sown. And so may we sow that seed that you have given to us generously. And may we just see uh, a rich harvest uh, result from that generosity. And um, may it go towards the praise of your glory. And we just praise you and thank you for the good things that we've seen in our midst as we see lives being transformed and changed. As uh, we see this body of believers serving one another with the gifts that you have given to them. And uh, we are excited for what we see 
um, in our future, Lord. Uh, even in the next few weeks, we, we really want to lift up to you um, our kids' ministry and our junior high camp, uh, these kids' camps and, and junior high camps that will be happening. Uh, we ask that you would already be preparing the hearts of those who will be coming, that uh, you would minister to them, that you would speak into their lives, and um, may um, you uh, just speak to those questions that they have, those uh, longings that they have in their heart, Lord. May it give their lives a sense of direction, and um, may they uh, trust in you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior. And um, we also, Lord, we want to lift up to you our victory tours. We thank you that we've just seen a, a full busload um, recently, and they have another trip coming up in August, and we just thank you for um, the fellowship that takes place on those ministries in the community that is found, and uh, and hopefully, Lord, just the encouragement that these believers can find in spending time with one another and sharing their life together. And for our visitation team, Lord, we thank you for the visits that they put into those who are our shut-ins and those who are experiencing health challenges. Um, Lord, may they, um, these uh, individuals that go and visit, uh, may they um, just extend a piece of uh, our fellowship to those who cannot physically make it out. And may those people just experiencing, experience the love of Christ through them. And Lord, we lift up a variety of ministries that will be starting up again in September, our discipleship groups, our classes, our women's ministries, the women's morning break, and uh, the women's circle. And we're just so excited about our men's ministry as well, Lord, that will be starting. And may it really use it to speak into the lives of, of our men. And we praise you for those ministries that have continued, um, our hospitality and greeters and uh, those who are with our children in Sunday school and our clothes closet and finance and when in praying for that, Lord, we do continue to ask that you would lead us to a new treasurer and um, that you would uh, set aside somebody who could use those gifts, Lord, to, uh, to just bless us and uh, relieve the burden from Ian, who has been so faithful in this area. And for our elders, and Lord, there's so many more ministries that take place, and uh, we just want to lift them up to you and ask that you would protect us from the evil one. Um, may you guard us, Lord, as a congregation from temptation, and uh, may we seek your face first, Lord, in all things that we do. And so, Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, children, up to the age of seven, uh, you can follow Scott, who is, who is flagless, but he has a hand waving. So follow Scott, and we just trust that you have a good time this morning. And if you want to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll begin reading in verse 1 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. I do not think I am in the least inferior to, these, to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. 
As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. George C. Parker, who was born in 1860, is regarded as one of the greatest con men in history. His greatest con was selling the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, which he did not own. Legends claim that he, he sold it at least twice a week, whether that's true or not. He did sell it multiple times, and once he even sold it for $50,000. Mr. Parker would approach people who were new to the country, engaging them in con, you know, casual conversation, and in, in introducing himself as the owner of the bridge. As soon as he had felt that he had their trust, he would then go on and tell them that he was, he was planning on putting toll booths in the bridge, and uh, he was looking for someone to work the booth, and he would make a job offer. And then Mr. Parker, upon them accepting that offer or wanted to know more about it, would take them to the bridge. On arrival, his, his mark you know, would see the sign that says, Bridge for Sale, which he himself just kind of pinned to the side of the bridge. He would then reveal that the bridge was for sale and that for a reasonable price it could be theirs and they could earn a fortune by putting in toll booths. The new owner of the bridge would only discover he was the victim of a con when the New York police would stop him as he tried setting up toll booths in the middle of the bridge, telling them that they, they'd been scammed. Mr. Parker did this so many times that the city got to a place where they would pass out cards to people who were new to the country and coming to New York, warning them, you can't buy public buildings or streets. The city was trying to wake up people to his deception because he not only falsely you know, sold the Brooklyn Bridge, he also sold Madison Square Garden, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Mr. Parker was convinced of, or convicted of fraud a number of times, but after his fourth conviction, he was sentenced to life in prison where he died you know, after being incarcerated for eight years. Paul might say, as he did in verse 15, his end was what his actions deserved. See, Mr. Parker, he proclaimed a false message. His work was deceitful. He pretended to be someone he wasn't, and he led many people astray. See, the apostle Paul, he was faced with the same type of problem in the Corinthian church. But instead of, you know, people peddling the Brooklyn Bridge for a prophet. Certain people were peddling the word of God for a prophet. He describes these people in verse 13 as false apostles, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. There were people in the church who proclaimed a false message and were pretending to be someone they, they weren't, and they're threatening to lead many people astray. However, Paul begins to challenge these false apostles here in chapter 11 in order to protect the church and really wake up the, the congregation to their deception. And many of us know false teaching is, is not a problem that only you know, Paul was faced with in his day. You know, if the church is not alert and sober-minded, they too can be deceived. It happens even in our day today. So the question I would like to ask is this, how can the church protect itself from being led astray? 
How can the church protect itself from being led astray? Let's face it, there's a lot of false messaging out in the world. How can we protect our church from losing its way and allowing a false gospel to creep into the ministry? This morning, I want us to listen to Paul and learn really from him and how he dealt with these issues. So if, you're, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, please open it with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And before we look at what Paul has to say, let's just ask the Lord to open our hearts and our minds to his word. Heavenly Father, it is your spirit that searches all things, even the deep things of God. For there is no one who knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And we pray that you would teach us by your spirit this morning, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words as your word is publicly proclaimed. Open our minds and hearts so that each one of us may receive your word to us so that we may know Jesus Christ through faith as our Lord and Savior and follow him in truth and love. In Jesus' name, amen. So how can we keep our church from losing its way? And to help us understand how we can, let's say, stay on the straight and narrow, I just want to highlight three things that Paul has his mind set on that really direct his actions. First, the church needs to be devoted to Christ. The church needs to be devoted to Christ. If we are to keep ourselves from losing our way, you know, our minds, our hearts, our actions, our message, our ministry must place Christ first. Christ must be Lord over all we do. Jesus must be valued and treasure above all things. When Jesus was asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. See, we are commanded by God to love Christ more than anyone. That's, that's including our family and friends, more than anyone or anything else in this world. And if we take our eyes off of the Christ, the one who we are following, it's very easy for us to lose our way. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments is this. You shall have no other gods before me. The church needs to be devoted to Christ. Let's look at what Paul says starting in verse 1. He says, I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. As we've seen kind of throughout this letter, Paul's ministry is being, is, has come under attack, and he's, he's defending himself. He's been defending himself throughout the letter, and being that his opponents boast about himself, Paul decides that he's going to fight fire with fire and boast about himself a little bit. Now, his boasting really doesn't start till about the second half of this chapter, um, and to him, it's foolishness to boast about oneself. If we're going to boast, we should, we should boast about Christ and what Christ has done within us and is doing through us. But he's going to boast a bit in order to get his point across. And so he, he prepares the Corinthians just for a little bit of his, his foolishness. And Pastor Jason's going to get more into this next week. For now, Paul says in verse 2, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Paul is not jealous of the church, but he's jealous for the church. With a, with a godly jealousy, not a human jealousy. So what, what's the difference? Now first, let's just go back to Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5, where the Lord says, and this is the second commandment of the ten, you shall make for yourself, an, you shall not, Sorry, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You hear that? God is a jealous God. But his jealousy is not, this is not a human jealousy. See, human jealousy is to be envious of someone who has something uh, they do not have. You know, a person might be jealous of another person because he or she has like a really nice car or a nice home or because a, a person has some ability they don't have 
or, or because of you know, his or her beauty or, or looks. But we know that as Christians, we are not to envy one another, for envy is a sin and it's not a characteristic of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 13.4, it says, love does not envy. Whereas godly jealousy, it's not a sin. God is not envious of people or, or, or what they have. God is jealous not of people, but for people. He is jealous for what belongs to him. God made us. He owns us. We are his, and we are to worship him in him alone. We are to love him above all things. But as the Bible tells us, we, we have all rejected our creator. We've all rebelled against him and sinned, and we have worshiped other things. And the consequence of our rebellion is death. To be separated from our loving creator, the one who we belong to for all eternity. However, even though we have rejected him, God still loves us. He created us not to be separated from him, but to be united with him. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to make an atonement for us. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And all who repent and believe are forgiven of their sin, and their relationship with God is restored, and they are given eternal life. See, God is jealous for people. He wants people for him. He wants a people for himself. A people who love him and worship him alone as he created us to do. It's because he is jealous he made a way for us to have eternal life. See, Paul is jealous for the church with a godly jealousy. He does not want to see the members of the church give their hearts to anyone but Jesus Christ. And because he is jealous with a godly jealousy, he, he works and ministers in order to bring people into the saving relationship with Jesus Christ and then disciple them. He says in, in, to the church in verse 2, I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Now to truly appreciate what Paul is saying here, we need to understand marriage in the Jewish culture. Among the Jews, betrothal was the first stage of marriage. Now, betrothal differs from our engagement in that betrothal was legally binding. It could only be canceled by a, a bill of divorce. You know, we just call off our engagement. But their their betrothal was legally binding. It can only be broken through divorce. And even though their commitment to one another was legally binding, the betrothed couple did not live together or have sexual relations until after their marriage ceremony. And if either the man or the woman were to have sexual relationships with another person during the betrothal, it was treated as adultery, which was punishable by death. And this is what we need to know uh, about marriage in this culture to help us understand Paul's illustration. In Jewish culture, it was the father's responsibility to safeguard his daughter's virginity. He was responsible to present his daughter as a pure virgin at her wedding. For if she wasn't, she would be stoned to death by law. Paul is saying he's the spiritual father of this church, for he started the church, and the church is his daughter. And she is betrothed to Christ. She has promised herself to Christ. The church is the bride, and the groom is Jesus. Paul takes on this responsibility to present the church as a pure virgin to Christ at the wedding, their wedding. And the wedding day is the day that Christ returns and comes for his bride, the church. See, we as the church, we're, we're in the betrothal period. We're waiting for our groom to come to us. However, Paul is concerned about his daughter and her purity. He doesn't want her to 
to cheat on Jesus. He is concerned for her and does not want her to commit spiritual adultery on Christ. See, if you've given your life to Jesus through faith, committing yourself to love him and worship him alone, but then you, you run off and love someone else or, or something else above Jesus, that's spiritual adultery. You've been unfaithful to the one that you have committed yourself to. You've gone behind Jesus' back and given your worship to an idol. Paul says to his daughter in verse three, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's coming, cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. In Genesis three, in the Garden of Eden, Satan appeared to Eve in the form of a snake, and he deceived her. She listened to him. Instead of loving God and obeying his command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she was unfaithful to her creator, to her God, and she ate the fruit. Paul is afraid that his daughter will be deceived by these false apostles that have come into the church that she will listen to them and be led astray from her sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul loves his daughter. He loves the church and he cares for the souls of its members and he works and ministers in order to help them remain faithful to Jesus. As he said, he wants to present his daughter to Christ as a pure virgin, not as one who goes around worshiping other gods. He says in verse 4, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Much like Eve, even though she knew God's command to not eat from the tree, she quickly listened to this, this other teaching. And instead of Adam, Adam trying to safeguard Eve's devotion to Christ, he just went along with her. Paul was concerned that the church would not listen to the teaching that they had received about Christ, but quickly abandoned it. And as an apostle, he had been given the responsibility uh, and the authority by Christ to go out and spread the gospel and lay the foundation for the church. His teaching is foundational for the church. However, it appears that new teaching came into the church at Corinth and, it, and its members it just put up with it and easily went along with it. The new leaders that had come in, they, they, they preached Jesus, but they preached a different Jesus than Paul preached. See, Paul preached the, the true Jesus, the eternal Son of God who took on flesh, was crucified for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and raised to life on the third day. Here's the danger. A false Jesus did not make atonement for us. A false spirit cannot give us life and lead us in Christ. A false, false gospel is not the wisdom of God, but it is the foolishness of the world, and it cannot save us. If a person believes a false gospel, they're still in the dark, dead in their sin. We must hold firmly that Christ died for our sins on the cross. He was buried, and on the third day, he was raised to life. So how can we protect our church from losing its way? We need to be devoted to Christ, to know Christ as he is in the scriptures. Do you know why I always ask you to open your Bibles when I preach? You ever wonder? because I want you to see what is in there for yourself. I want you to know Christ from the pages of God's word, and I want you to hold me accountable when I preach. That I preach Jesus, the Jesus that Paul preached. That I preach the Jesus that saves. That I preach the spirit that gives life, convicts us of our sin, and transforms us in the, into the character of Christ that I preach the gospel that sets people free from sin and death through faith in Jesus Christ.
who died for our sins. We need to be devoted to Christ and safeguard our church so that we are found faithful when Jesus Christ returns for us. The elders of our church, like Paul, have the responsibility to watch over us so that we are pure for Christ. And they, one way they do that is they, to make sure that the teaching that goes on in the church is of sound doctrine so our minds are not led astray from our sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And here's, here's one reason why membership is important to us. When a person becomes a member, the elders have the opportunity to interview that person and to the best of their ability, affirm that they do have a true and saving faith, that their baptism is credible, and that they agree with the doctrine of our church. And when a person becomes a member, they're agreeing to come under the care and the authority of the elders, saying to them, hold me accountable. Hold me accountable. And if they, you know, and some of us, we're given teaching roles. And if they're giving a teaching role, they're saying, I'm going to, I'm going to teach the doctrine of our church. That's why it's important that those who teach are members of the church. It helps put safeguards in place. It actually helps the elders to do their ministry well. As overseers, it says in Hebrews 13, 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this, that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. And my encouragement to you is this. If you're not yet a member of this church, please join us. Let's stand together for Christ and safeguard our church. For this church, our church, needs to be devoted to Christ. Along with devotion to Jesus, the church needs to be devoted to one another. The church needs to be devoted to one another. When Jesus was asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love for God and for people. It goes hand in hand. Jesus commands us and says, love each other as I have loved you. The church has been commanded by Christ to be devoted to one another. And when you look at what Paul did for the church, you can really see his love for these people and his devotion to them. Paul could have easily, he could have easily abandoned the church in Corinth. And as we've read, I mean, you just got to read the two letters that we have. They were not easy to get along with. But a good father will never give up on his daughter. Her life belongs to her. He cares for her soul deeply. A good father will persevere with his daughter because he loves her. Paul was devoted to these people. And he really, he had this amazing vision for them in his ministry. On the day of Christ's return, he envisioned himself really standing before Jesus and presenting to Christ the people he loved and the people that he brought to faith and discipled. I think it will be just a great honor and just this true joy for us to stand before Jesus. And, and when he asks us, what, you, what have you done with your life? We, we, we can say, Jesus, these are the people that we loved. These are the people that we ministered to and brought to faith and discipled here through the ministry of Victory Baptist Church. Let's serve together and just let's make that vision a reality. Let's listen to Paul. Starting in verse 5, he writes, I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. Paul's using sarcasm here. It stands to reason the super apostles that he's speaking about are the false apostles that he refers to in verse 13. And Paul Paul is an actual apostle who was sent out by Christ. However, there are other men in the church claiming to, to be an apostle as well, and not only an apostle, but really one that is superior to Paul. Or as he calls them, super apostles. Maybe they had capes and they flew around spreading the good news. I don't know. 
These super apostles were persuasive public speakers, whereas Paul wasn't as polished, let's say sophisticated, or maybe as entertaining as these fellows were. And they used that against him. They saw him as inferior because he lacked this formal training. Paul says in verse 6, I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We've made this perfectly clear to you in every way. What type of preacher would you rather listen to? One who speaks about the heart or one who speaks from the heart? There's a story told about a dinner party where guests were expected to stand after the meal and recite something to all the guests. A famous actor happened to be present at one of these meals and he recited the 23rd Psalm with great dramatic flair and emotion and he sat down to great applause. Then a very simple man got up and began to recite the same psalm. He wasn't very eloquent, so at first people thought it was a little funny. But his presentation was straight from the heart. So when he finished, all the guests, they just sat in respectful silence. It was obvious that the simple man's presentation was more powerful than the actor's. And afterwards, the actor said to him, I may know the psalm, but you know the shepherd." I'll take the preacher who knows Christ. For a false Jesus cannot save me, a false spirit cannot lead me, and a false gospel is foolish, empty, and of no value to me. Paul knew Christ. And I want to show you what he did because he was devoted to the church and cared deeply about their relationship with Jesus. He says in verse 7, Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to evaluate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? Paul preached, for Corinth, or Paul preached for free in Corinth. Now, I've said this before. I'm not Paul, okay? I'm not doing this for free, okay? Jason and Carolyn, they're expecting their third child soon. Scott and Rebecca, they're going to be getting married soon. They're not doing this for free either, okay? So let's not get any <laughs> wild ideas, Okay? But Paul, he preached for free, even though he had the right, even though he had the right to earn a living as a preacher. But why did he preach for free to the Corinthians? Now, what I do want you to understand first, though, is that Paul did receive financial support from other churches. He says in verse 8, I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I've kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Interestingly, Paul wouldn't take money from the Corinthian church, even though they were wealthy. They were affluent. But he took money from the Macedonians, who we've learned are, were poor. When you dig into this, you find that the Paul wouldn't let a church that he is preaching at pay him, but he would accept the, the uh, support from a church if he was a preaching at another church. What he was doing is he was creating partnerships, ministry partnerships with other churches, very much like, you know, we support other mis missionaries. However, he's boasting that he preached the Corinthians for free. Why, he asks in verse 11, because I do not love you, God knows I do. In the culture of that day, if a public speaker didn't make money for his speaking, he was often disregarded as a poor speaker, and he, he just, kind of his teaching was worthless. And the church would have really, would have been embarrassed about Paul and the fact that he wouldn't accept money. They would have it would have reflected on them poorly in their social standing. But he didn't refuse, but he didn't refuse money because he didn't love them. He, he did so, it's out of love, okay? And here it is in verse 12, he says. This is why. I will keep on doing what I'm doing, ministering for free, in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. He preached for free in order to expose the false, or false apostles and that their, their motives were far from pure. 
He's trying to wake up the church from this deception. Paul refused to accept money from the Corinthians because it was a way for him to distinguish his ministry from that of the false apostles who had come into this church and were preaching out of greed. They're just peddling the word of God for money. And Paul's boast, it sounds like this. These super apostles who are trying to take over my ministry say that they are equal to me as an apostle and that they do the same job as me. And not only the same job, but they do it better is what they're saying. However, if they are equal and provide you with the same ministry, then why are they not preaching for free like me? Something not the same. These men were not devoted to the members of the church as Paul was, but, he saw it, but they saw it as a way to make a profit. So Paul wanted to cut the ground from under them. And it's kind of like this. You take their money away from them, they'll go away. Paul was protecting his daughter. The church needs to be devoted to one another. And out of love for Christ, we need to watch out for each other so that we are ready for when Christ comes for his bride. As a part of this devotion to one another, the church needs to guard itself against Satan and his servants. The church needs to guard itself against Satan and his servants. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Just as Satan deceived Eve in the garden, the devil continues to seek out people that he can deceive and lead astray. We need to stand guard as a church and be sober-minded, clear-minded, instead of minds that are, are dulled by excessive alcohol and drug use. Let's say this. Let's say your life was being threatened. And so to protect you, security guards were stationed at your front door, and their, their job was to protect you from any enemies that may come to get you. Would you want the security guards to be sober when they were protecting your home and your, really your life? Or would you be fine with them drinking on the job and taking drugs? I'll say this, if you care about your life, you would want them sober-minded. Our enemy, the devil, is out to deceive us and devour us. We are to be sober-minded so that we can protect ourselves and watch out for one another, kind of being ready to resist the devil and stand firm in our faith. And know this, Satan doesn't work alone. Listen to what Paul says about the super apostles that had infiltrated the church, starting in verse 13, and he uses some strong language here. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising, then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. He calls these false apostles servants of Satan. We must be on our guard against people whose message presents a false Jesus, a false spirit, a false gospel. The world is full of false messages that do not save. And I'll say this, on the surface, they, they can sound right. They can appear like truth. But we have to be careful, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He, he, takes, he takes the truth. He knows the truth. He's well versed in it. And he twists it ever so slightly. But remember, a half-truth is a whole lie. And I'll say this, though. We do have to be careful, though, how we talk about one another. There, there is a difference between someone preaching, you know, a, a false Jesus and having a disagreement with a brother or sister about something, you know, Jesus said. Just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean that they're a false teacher or a servant of Satan. They're a fellow believer. Paul reminds us of what is of first importance in 1 Corinthians 15. 
He writes, starting in verse 1, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. If you ever want to be reminded of what the gospel, what's at the heart of the gospel, go right to this passage. I often do. I just, I love this passage. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelfth. Let us take our stand on the gospel that saves. We believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, that he died on a cross for our sins, that he was buried and raised to life on the third day. We believe that all who believe are forgiven of their sin and made alive by the Holy Spirit who, who produces the character of Christ in us. We believe that, that, the, that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The church needs to safeguard itself against Satan and his servants. For we, you do not want to be counted as one of Satan's servants who merely pretend to be servants of righteousness. For as Paul says in verse 15, their end will be there. Their end will be what their actions deserve. They will be punished by God for their sin. And that's eternity in hell. To close, I want to leave you with three ways to guard yourself from Satan's attack. One, develop the discipline of reading your Bible regularly each week. There are so many false and deceptive messages out in the world today, and it's easy to get led astray by them. Anchor yourself in the truth of God's word. I know that uh, Pastor Jason, he, he's planning on, on challenging the youth group to read through the New Testament this year, starting in, in September. And he's going to be providing them with a reading plan that lays out a schedule so it can be read in a year by just reading five minutes a day, five times a week, which I would say is very manageable and a great place to start. And if you'd like one of those reading plans, we've printed them off. They're at the information desk just on, on the, the rack there. Please grab one. And um, He's going to start with the youth group in, in September and maybe you Set a goal for yourself this year. Say, you know what? I'm going to read through. I'm going to read through the New Testament and really just establish that discipline of being in God's Word on a regular basis. In Psalm 119:11, it says, "I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you." See, reading, hearing, meditating on, and memorizing God's Word is how one our, our heart is transformed and changed through the power of Christ so that we will not sin against God. God's word protects us from Satan's attack. Two, develop the discipline of regular prayer. Paul tells the church in Ephesians 6, 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Pray each day. Pray throughout the day. Set aside time for prayer. Prayer is a spiritual weapon that God has given us to help us fight against the devil's schemes Prayer, it has divine power. Christ came to destroy the work of the devil. Christ himself was tempted by Satan, but he did not sin. He, you know, Jesus knows how to resist the devil. Jesus knows how to uh, defeat Satan and flee from temptation. Call on him to help you, to guide you, help you flee from temptation. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul writes, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. You know, I'll say this. That, that verse has just kind of stuck with me since I, I, I preached it the other week. And uh, there's just been a number of challenges that have come up in my life lately. And I, this verse just keeps coming to mind. And it's just this encouragement to me just to keep bringing these challenges that we face to the Lord. You see, when we fight our battles, we we're to fight on our knees in prayer. It's divine power in prayer. And know this, when you're tempted to sin, God will always give you a way out. 
It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 14, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. God never boxes you in where you have to sin. It's always a way out, a way to flee. When tempted, just call on the Lord for that strength to resist the devil and his attack. Put on your running shoes. Put on your running shoes and the best, it's just, just won't run away from idolatry. Run away from sexual morality. Develop the discipline of daily prayer. And third, develop the discipline of attending church. Be here on Sunday mornings. Make this a priority in your week. For being with the Lord's people is of great value. It's, it's easy to be led astray when we are isolated. We really, we do need the, the encouragement of the church family to help us stay devoted to Christ. One strategy that lions use when they hunt is they will, they will run headlong into a herd of their prey, you know, creating chaos and really seeking to scatter them. And then they chase down the animal that is farthest separated from the herd and devour them. See, the devil will try to separate us from the church. And I've seen it happen in people's lives. People who drift from the church, they tend to be weaker in their faith, weaker in their devotion to Christ, to the point where there's been times where I'm like, does, does this person even believe in Jesus any longer? It says in Hebrews 10, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the day more as you see the day approaching. Let us not give up meeting together, especially being the day of Christ's approach or coming is getting closer. It's just a question. How, how do you want Christ to find you when he returns? I want him to find us pure and devoted to him. For we are his bride and we are betrothed to him. May we be faithful to Christ, loving one another as he loved us and worshiping God and God alone. Flee from idolatry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you, God, are holy. You are pure. Nothing unclean will ever enter your presence, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Forgive us, Lord, of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness so that we may be presented to Christ with sincere and pure devotion. Forgive us, Lord, for giving our worship to idols and false gods. May our hearts belong to you and you alone. And we thank you for being faithful to us and sending us your son, Jesus. We ask that you would give us the strength to resist the schemes of the devil so that we might not sin against you. May we be rooted in your word. Open our hearts and minds to the gospel so that we may believe and be saved. By the power and wisdom of your spirit, help us to develop the spiritual disciplines of reading your word, praying, and committing ourselves to your church. Lord, be with our elders as they watch over us. Give them the wisdom and love to be faithful fathers who care for their children so that we will not be deceived and led astray, but stand firm in Christ, being led by the spirit and hold firmly to the gospel so that we may be ready for when Christ comes for his bride, his church. We love you, Lord, with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Scott up as we sing to our Lord. It won't always be easy as we learn to build these disciplines in our lives. It'll be challenging. It'll be hard. There's difficulty ahead. But let me tell you, it's not in vain. That work, it means something because there's glory coming. 
We are one day with Christ standing in his glory. And that devotion that we show now is going to be well worth it in the end. So would you stand and join us in song as we sing of this labor unto glory. My God, wherever I go, glory. Where I reap and where I sow, glory. When my hands they grip the thorn, glory. In the still and in the storm, glory. Glory. kingdom come the sun it shines and then goes down glory rain it pours and beats the ground glory dust it blows and ends my days glory hearts they burn beneath your gaze, glory, glory, oh, we labor unto glory, till heaven and earth are one, oh, we labor unto glory, until God's kingdom comes, oh, we labor unto glory, till heaven bound glory where thorns no longer curse the ground glory trim the wick ignite the flame glory my work it will not be in vain glory glory God's kingdom come. Amen. Let's work together and let's go until we get the glory with Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So, a few announcements for us. I'd first like to invite Debbie Laker up to the front. I've just invited one Debbie up to the front, so if you do not know who she is, you know who, who she is, okay? Debbie leads our Women Morning Break ministry with a leadership team of women, other women. And for their ministry, if you don't know, they put on monthly events starting in September that run from September to uh, May on Saturday mornings from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., In each month, they have a special guest speaker that will come and just speak to the women that they gather just to encourage them and build them up in their faith. And also just gives uh, women an opportunity just to fellowship together and and grow in their love for one another. And Grud really has been growing their ministry over the years. Uh, Their Saturday events started, I think, with an average of about 25 to 30 in attendance uh, when they first began, but by the end of last year, they were up to 
80 women attending these events, which we praise the Lord for. It's just this wonderful testimony to what God is, is doing through Debbie and her leadership team in this ministry. But as you can imagine, setting up and cleaning up for an event like this takes some organization. Just so you know, they set up about 10 to 12 tables in the sanctuary here uh, and gather all the chairs around them. And this year, Debbie and her team, they're looking for some people who are be willing to commit themselves to helping clean up after the sa Saturday event. We have set up taken care of, but we need people to help uh, with cleanup after their Saturday event who would be willing to put away the tables and also kind of resetting the chairs so we're ready for Sunday morning. And they would be, one, they'd be happy if, if there was women that, that wanted to commit to this, but they're also, they're, they're opening this up to men as well just to help with the, the cleanup team, okay? So men, you can, you can clean up. You can't come, but you can come clean up, all right? Just get over it. It's fine. Okay, but they, they're looking to put together a team who would just be willing to come after the, they finish at 11.30, probably if we had enough people together in about an hour, we could get everything cleaned up. Many hands make light work. So if you're interested in, in joining this and just supporting really this wonderful women's ministry, you can see Debbie after the service. She'll be at the information desk. Uh, you can sign up there, you can get more information from her. Also, Debbie and her team would love to offer childcare uh, at these events this year, just to encourage young moms to be able to come out. If you're willing to help care for children during these events, please also speak with Debbie and her team. Their plan would be to, uh, to put together a team of women who would take turns looking after the children, so it wouldn't necessarily be you every month. If we can build a large enough team, we can put on Put, do it in a rotation and just care for, one, the children that come, but really caring for the mothers that come as well. So I'm looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in their ministry this year. And really, Debbie, I just appreciate your commitment and your team's commitment just to the women of this church. And we just thank you for that. Okay. I'd like to invite uh, Doug Armstrong up. He's just got a Victory Tours announcement. Good morning. I actually got two things. The first is the Bible study is on again this week, uh, so Wednesday at 1.30. And uh, for the play that's coming up on August the 29th, it's a Thursday, and we'll meet here at 9 o'clock. Bus will leave at 9.30, and uh, we'll be stopping for lunch before the theater, which starts at 2 o'clock. Uh, just so you know, Cole Porter's joyful and high-spirited musical comedy follows the ferocious backstage antics of a touring company performing The Taming of the Shrew, featuring a flamboyant, feuding couple, gun-toting gangsters, and some of the best numbers ever written for the stage. Another opinion, another show, too darn hot, Wonder Bar, So in Love, and Brush Up on Your Shakespeare. It's a great play, and uh, it's musical as well, and I have to book tickets tomorrow. So if you're interested, uh, please let me know. I'll be out at the welcome booth. Did you all, for those of you who do participate, did you get the email that I sent out just recently with the information? Yes, no? No? Yeah, I had a couple of other people that said they had not received it as well. So I will try and send it again later today. But if you're interested in going, please see me out there and I'll give you some more information. God bless. Thank you, Doug. Our church family picnic is scheduled for Saturday, September 21st. For those of you who've never attended, we as a church just host a, a, a barbecue in September at Anchor Park for our church family. There's no cost. We serve hot dogs, hamburgers, veggie burgers, salad and soft drinks, and also we, we always get the, the ice cream truck to, to come. Yes. Now, to put on an event like this, we need volunteers. And so if you're interested and able to help serve at, this, uh, at the picnic, there's a sign-up sheet just out on the table outside uh, the auditorium. Please just read the different jobs uh, that we need uh, filled. Also, if, if you're planning on coming, we also need you to sign up just to let us know how many are coming, what you would like to eat, so that just we can prepare for food. For those of you who have already signed up for serving, I want to thank you. Know that I will be contacting you. I'm actually just 
I, I'm going on vacation for the next two weeks, so when I will be off, but once I come back, I will reach out and I'll get everything organized. So if you haven't heard from me right away, understand I'm going to be away, but I'll get it all pulled together at the end of August. Just keep signing up. Before we just close this part of our service and have communion, I just want to, I want to send you with Revelation 19, 6 to 9. Where it says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. May the God of love and peace be with you as you devote yourself to Christ.